Okay, great. We're going to our next speaker, which is Amy Souza. And Amy is a women's rights activist, organizer, writer, speaker, and educator. Um, uh, she has a background in professional theater and an MA in depth psychology. The focus of her work is embodiment and safeguarding. She holds workshops and classes focusing on embodiment and intuition. And thank you so much for coming, Amy. And the title of Amy's talk is Gender, Dys Gender Dysphoria and the Engineering of the Trans Child. So thank you so much, Amy, and over to you. I want to really underscore here that just like the term uh, transgender, uh, the term gender dysphoria is a term that is ultimately so vague as to be utterly meaningless. So today I'm going to briefly break down the 10 page DSM 5 TR diagnosis of gender dysphoria, as well as the diagnostic criteria. Uh, I really want to show that it's not just ill defined, but it lacks any discrete meaning. Uh, and I really think this term, gender dysphoria, is one of the last hooks. It, it's still trapping us in our GC arguments. And even in highly popular critical books like Abigail Schreier's Irreversible Damage, it reinforces the notion of rapid onset gender dysphoria and solidifies it rather than challenging the assumptions behind it. Uh, I really want to say that uh, for me, what I see here uh, is that this term, gender dysphoria, is really a social engineering device. It's used to distract, it's used to manipulate, and it's used to disguise what is actually happening to kids. It serves a depoliticizing function uh, and creates a cultural empathy trap designed to obscure the brutality, the brutal reality of child sterilization and genital mutilation of children. So at first, uh, we're going to look at the terms and uh, bear with me, I, I perhaps should have made a slide for these, but it was going to be my only slide. I, this is not really a slide heavy presentation. So I'm just going to read through these terms so you get an idea of them. So just kind of uh, listen, I'm going to breeze through them so we can get to the main points. So um, the diagnostic manual, uh, again, it devotes uh, uh, an entire chapter, first of all, to gender dysphoria. There's only 22 chapters in in uh, the DSM, and one whole chapter is devoted to this. Um, so as it defines its own terms, it defines sex and sexual as referring to biological indicators of male and female understood to um, represent the context of reproductive capacity. Gender in this definition is used to denote the public, social, cultural, uh, usually legally recognized lived role as boy, girl, man, or woman, or quote, other gender. Uh, biological factors are seen as contributing to gender. Uh, gender assignment refers to the assignment of male or female. Uh, this usually happens at birth based on your birth sex. Birth assigned sex is used interchangeably with birth assigned gender. Uh, gender atypical refers to somatic features or behaviors that are not typical in individuals of the same assigned gender in a given society. Um, Non-diagnostic terms uh, that are used are gender nonconforming, gender variant, and gender diverse. Uh, gender identity is seen as a category of social identity referring to an individual's identification as male, female, or some other category category in between, i.e. gender fluid, uh, or a category other than male or female, uh, i.e. gender neutral. And finally, uh, gender dysphoria is the marked incongruence between the gender to which they have been assigned, uh, usually based, again, on the phenotypic sex at birth, and their experience slash expressed gender. The discrepancy here, uh, uh, the incongruence is the core component of the diagnosis. Uh, and what they look for in the diagnostic criteria is evidence about distress of this incongruence. So 
these are the definitions and there's a couple of things to note here. Uh, first of all, we see there is a massive conflation of sex and gender. The underlying unspoken assumption that every human is born with a gender identity <laughs> uh, and the notion that discomfort with sexist role projection from the culture is evidence of a disorder. So obviously feminists have long critiqued uh, gender as a hierarchical structure of sexist oppression. Uh, and many feminists before me, way before me, uh, have noted that gender ideology is inherently sexist. And so the, psychologic, the psychological diagnosis of gender dysphoria is no less sexist than gender itself. So the diagnostic criteria for child gender dysphoria reinforces these sexist stereotypes. So the criteria that I'm going to read, these are meant to be the criteria based on uh, that, that they base a diagnosis uh, on a, of a child for. Uh, these criteria include wearing the opposite gender's clothes, uh, playing cross-gender roles in make-believe, strong preference for toys, games, activ activities stereotypically engaged in by the other gender. Uh, note that they imply there's two here. Um, they're not just preference for the other gender's games, but a strong dislike or rejection of masculine toys games activities for boys, a strong dislike rejection of feminine toys games activities for girls, um, a strong preference for playmates of the other gender, um, and a strong dislike of one's sexual anatomy. So first of all, that last uh, symptom, uh, disliking your sexual anatomy, wanting to remove your sexual anatomy, I'm not going to get into this whole conversation here, uh, but that is a strong indicator of sexual abuse in your past. If you want to dissociate from your genitals, if a child comes to you with that, uh, the first question should be uh, looking into the child's history of abuse. But the rest of these criteria are really a, a huge display of sexist stereotypes that are now apparently being medically reinforced by enshrining these criteria in a diagnostic code. So the, these, these sexist stereotypes are now in, in, a, in a DSM manual, in the diagnostic manual that is used almost globally um, um, for diagnoses. Um, so it enshrines these preferences for cultural stereotypes as an indicator of, of, of mental health. So if you agree with these um, stereotypes, that's now an indicator of mental health. And rejecting these stereotypes is now cause for a mental health diagnosis. So, you know, I, I, I hope that we, as I open up this conversation, we will continue to have more conversations about this because this diagnosis is extremely problematic and it's harming kids. Um, so there are, again, other women and, and um, people who are talking about this. There is a clinical psychologist and radical feminist, Stephanie Bode. Uh, she wrote a four pub article, Four Reasons to Stop Saying Gender Dysphoria. And she says that these vague and sexist stereotypes create the very symptoms uh, that they claim to describe. Uh, she says, gender dysphoria is no less a social construction than gender is, the concept of gender dysphoria on the one hand focuses on distress and on the other hand on a story that is supposed to explain this distress, the mismatch between sex and sex role stereotypes. So this diagnosis fails to account for the fact that this distress may have another cause, another story. Um, the story, but the story of, of gender dysphoria is now superseding any possible other story uh, that could happen. And because we now have a culture of affirmation only, there is really no space for any other story behind these symptoms to become expressed. Uh, the problem for the patient is that it misdirects any potential cultural outrage at sex role enforcement into an internal loathing. Um, so this is a huge problem. Um, 
uh, Bode also notes that using the term incongruence within the criteria suggests that everyone should fulfill a sex role. Uh, it doesn't reject sex roles or sex role stereotypes. It affirms them and just only problematizes the distress. So Exactly. The definition of gender dysphoria boils down to a discomfort with cultural sex role progress, uh, projections where congruence uh, would mean a compliance with cultural stereotype roles and incongruence is a rejection of and discomfort with cultural stereotype roles. So rather than giving a child a critical analysis of a culture that uses sexist stereotypes for girls, and Sheila Jeffries in her amazing book notes that these roles are used to confine and limit behavior and justify the inferior status of girls in societies. And of course, for boys, even though these stereotypes are different, they are no less limiting and constricting in allowable expressions of behavior. Thus, this diagnosis serves a depoliticizing function. It takes a justifiable and natural response to the external world and culture and makes it an internal problem of the individual. Um, so James Hillman, who is a depth psychologist, that is the, the, the background of the kind of psychology that I studied for my own master's degree. He has a great book called We've Had a Hundred Years of Psychotherapy and the World is Getting Worse. Uh, so he says, every time we try to deal with our outrage over the freeway, our misery over the office, the crime on the streets, whatever, every time we try to deal with that by going to therapy for our fear and rage, we are depriving the political world of something. When the patient talks about being angry about something, how is it talked about? Is it talked about as a personal problem? Is it talked about in terms of aggression and hostility and why you have an external authority problem? Or is it taken up as a vital part of the citizen's life? That would be the cell of revolution. And it begins with the realization that things are not right and an analysis of how they are not right. That is the first job. And that is the real job of therapy because therapy deals with things that are not right. It's called dysfunction. But instead of imagining that I am dysfunctional, that my family is dysfunctional, you realize that the civilization is dysfunctional. The society is dysfunctional. Functional. The political process is dysfunctional. And we have to work on cures that are beyond my personal cure. That is revolution. That's realizing that things out there are dysfunctional. So children who are uncomfortable with the sex role that is projected on their sex are not dysfunctional. They do not have a mental illness. There is nothing wrong with them. They are having an accurate response to a dysfunctional culture. So we can also think about this the way a naturopath might think about medicine, where the symptom is just a reaction to the root issue. And the symptom is not the problem. Rather, the symptom is a signal pointing to the problem. So if you get a fever in response to an infection, the fever is a symptom of healthy functioning as the, as the body tries to fight the infection. So in this sense, a child's discomfort with sex role projection is also a symptom of healthy functioning in response to a sexist, regressive, limiting infection of cultural roles. But rather than giving kids the language and support they need to critique the culture and affect 
change. They are in a sense being told that there is no infection. <laughs> they're, they're being told that the culturally designated sex roles are natural and that there's no way to change them since they're innate to sex bodies. So children are being stripped of any and all political agency. Uh, and instead they're being told to that, that they're, they're being told that in order to relieve the pressure, they have to purchase new body parts, remove old body parts uh, and take mind altering and body altering drugs. Um, so uh, I'm going to go into some uh, critiques of the DSM itself, and I'm going to start with uh, James Davies. He is a medical anthropologist. Um, he is also a psychoanalyst himself, and he's written a number of great books and articles uh, and lectures about this, um, uh, not about our issue, but about critiquing uh, the, the diagnostic manual in general. Uh, so he talks about the flaws and failures of the biological model of mental health that makes mental illness into one of faulty brain chemistry. And he also shares Hillman's value that defining natural responses to emotional states and social pressures as mental illness is highly depoliticizing. So I'm going to read from him now. He notes that we blame suffering on faulty minds and brains rather than on harmful social and political work environments. Consequently, our distress is no longer seen as a vital call to change or as anything potentially transformative or instructive. It's rather become over the last few decades an occasion for yet more buying and selling. Whole industries thrive off of this logic, offering self-centered explanations and solutions for the many pains of living. The cosmetic industry locates our, our misery in our aging. The diet industry locates our misery in our bodily imperfections. The fashion industry locates it in us being passe, and the pharmaceutical industry locates it in our so-called faulty brain chemicals. Now, each industry offers its own profitable elixir for emotional success. They all share and promote the same consumerist philosophy of suffering, that your central problem is not that you've been mistaught to understand or engage with your difficulties, your aging, your trauma, your sadness, your anxiety, your grief, but the fact that you are suffering at all. Um, and that is something that targeted consumption can address. Where, where suffering is the new bad and failing to consume the right remedies is the new injustice. So what is the tool for the dissemination of pharmaceutical consumption? The DSM. OK, the DSM, first of all, I don't know if, if you know, if, if some of you are um, therapists or social workers, you, you may already know this, but the DSM is a private document. It is owned and written completely by the APA within house, uh, the APA being the American Psychological Association. Uh, and though it is privately owned, it has vast public reach and public in implications far beyond the United States. It is used almost universally globally. Um, there, there are some other diagnostic manuals out there, but this is the main one that is used. So it's used, of course, by therapists and social workers. Um, it establishes psychiatric conditions that are taught in medical and other professional schools. It determines eligibility for disability payments, uh, for insurance compensation. It um, it makes uh, it, it lets you know which diagnoses are targeted by pharmaceutical providers. Um, it it um, determines what uh, disorders become objects of psychiatric research. Um, it has implications for FDA regulations that require the drug industry to market its products as treatments for particular DSM diagnoses. And it's embedded in the administrative apparatus of hospitals. Uh, the judicial system, the education system, uh, and most importantly, it deals with how individuals conceive their own psychological problems. So it influences the culture at large. Um, there's a few things uh, that Davies provides um, archetypal interview data about. 
And one of the main things um, that I think is very important that I, even as uh, someone who went to school for psychology, I did not actually realize this. Maybe some others of you did. Uh, but the DSM diagnoses um, are not a process of uh, research, um, peer reviewed research, and um, uh, going back and forth uh, first. And it is. It, it the the entire book is written by committee consensus and vote. Okay, research is secondary. Research is done after the fact. So it's based on the a clinical. Ex, they, it is based on the the experience um, that that these um, therapists and psychologists are having with their patients, with their clients. But it's based on personal experiences and then discussed in committee. And sometimes these committees are, are as small as, as nine, 12 people. They can be very small. And um, sometimes what happens, and again, um, there's archetypal interview data about this. Je uh, Davies talks about how sometimes uh, they would be arguing and, and it ended up being the loudest voices in the room were the ones that got their diagnosis written down. So they're, they're writing these diagnoses and they're deciding the diagnostic criteria. So they, they decide things like whether or not uh, you have um, a major depressive disorder. Uh, they decide whether it means you, you've had lingering depression for two weeks or five weeks. The, these things are arbitrarily decided on by consensus. This, this should be insane to all of us. Uh, this, this in itself should discredit our belief, our, our, um, our belief in this manual. But um, in terms of helping you understand this voting system, uh, I want to talk about something that I think will um, excite our interest a little bit more. So, of course, we know that homosexuality uh, was previously considered a mental disorder. Um, this lasted as far as the DSM-2. Now, it was removed in the DSM-3. And you might, again, you might think, well, this was removed uh, because new research came to light. Uh, people really... Uh, uh, we had a deeper understanding of, uh, of homosexuality. No, it was voted out. <laughs> now, of course, I'm happy that, that uh, homosexuality is not labeled a disorder within the DSM, but I'm not happy that it happened because of activist lobbying rather than scientific research uh, uh, criteria. So, LGBT groups, lobbying groups, um, have, have not just been pivotal in getting uh, homosexuality removed, but they have been pivotal in shaping the gender dysphoria diagnosis. So there's a quote from Alan Horowitz, who wrote the book, um, The DSM, a, a History of Psychiatry's Bible. Uh, he says that in response to activist concerns, the DSM-5 created a condition that they could justify reimbursement for sex reassignment surgery. So, so part of what how this diagnosis has come into being is, is lobbyists. Who, who want medical reimbursement for, for plastic surgery and drugs. Um, these dynamics, of course, illustrate that the diagnostic dis decisions um, depend far more on particular interests and values rather than on evidence-based standards. Um, and ironically, some of the LGBT groups that, that fought the DSM-2 and, and they were coming from a place of being anti-diagnostic during that DSM-2 process now have later maintained, fought to maintain gender dysphoria as a diagnosis. So they've entirely switched their own position in order to reinforce <laughs> um, to, to reinforce this diagnosis. So they're no longer anti-diagnosis. Um, now, the real question should be, why do activists have influence over the entire mental health field? As I said, it has massive public ramifications. Um, what other medical diagnosis is, is influenced by lobbyists? And activists, why do lobbyists and activists have their hand in any kind of medicine? 
Um, so I want to uh, note quickly, um, because I know she's already spoken here about this, but if everyone doesn't already know, uh, Genevieve Gluck has done massive research into WPATH, and I want to again point out, so she uncovered a man, uh, Thomas W. Johnson, retired professor of California State University, Chico. He was a formative member of the body modification fetish site the eunuch archive and his academic interests advocate um, advocated for expanding the concept of gender identity to include men with sadomasochistic and even pedophilic castration fantasies. This man was also uh, bragged about being influential in editing the DSM-5's diagnosis for gender dysphoria. Um, so this, of course, is a conflict of interest. Um, Davies also makes a massive critique along with some other men like uh, Robert Whitaker, who wrote Mad in America. Um, th there's a lot of people who make this critique, but I just want to offer it up. I'm going to kind of move through some of these critiques. Um, there is no biological basis for the so-called mentor disorders listed in the DSM. There's no blood, urine, saliva test you can do uh, in the way you might do for like bronchitis or smallpox. And the makers of the DSM know this. The DSM-3 uh, Dr. Robert Spitzer's confided to Davies that no biological markers have been identified for any of the diagnoses within the DSM. Um, the, the Alan Horowitz book, The History of the DSM, notes that three-fourths of the members of the latest uh, DSM-5 task force had ties to drug companies. Three fourths of the writers of this had ties to drug companies. So, um, also, pervasive drug advertisements are the most significant disseminator of information to the general public about the diagnoses within the DSM. Uh, and this is a point that I want to make. Uh, Davies makes this point. So he found out that when the DSM-5 came out in 2013, it was number one on the Amazon bestsellers list. And it was in the top 10 of the Amazon uh, bestseller for over six months. Now, no, this is a this is a very dry diagnostic manual that costs over a hundred dollars. This was a number one bestseller, and he set out to say why, and and also just to to give you some of the scope. Um, at the same time, the, the latest Harry Potter book was ranked at six uh, and Fifty Shades of Grey was ranked at nine. <laughs> so why, why was this, this on the number one list, on the number one sellers list for so long? This is because different companies within the pharmaceutical industry buy the DSM in bulk and then distribute it for free to clinicians. And again, uh, Robert Spitzer, who was the chair of the DSM-3, acknowledged that, quote, the pharmaceuticals were delighted with the manual's widespread medicalization of distress as it created a vast and highly profitable market for their products. And this market is growing. Uh, Davies notes that if a child in the 70s had leukemia, uh, they would have a 20% of survival. Now the survival rate for child leukemia is 80%, and that is a 300% improvement in the last four decades. And almost every area of medicine has seen these kind of improvement rates, but not so with the mental health field. So this, this, this is true. Despite 25% of the UK population being being on mental health drugs and 24% of the US population being on mental health drugs, rates of unemployment due to mental health reasons has been exponentially rising. So, so where other fields of medicine, things are getting exponentially better in mental health, things are apparently getting exponentially worse. And this is, of course, because the DSM is not really in the business of creating cures. It's in the business of creating new identities, of creating new patients. Um, and we have this false notion that an anti psychotic or antidepressant is an antidote for mental illness in the same way that 
penicillin G is, is a cure for syphilis, um, but these are not antidotes or cure. Gender affirming care via plastic surgery and mind altering, body altering hormones is not a cure for identity issues. The DSM is, is in the business of making more patients, not fewer. And in the book of woe, um, Greenberg uh, noted that when the Asperger's disorder was removed from the DSM, the APA received tens of thousands of letters about this. Why? Um, APA president at the time, Carol Bernstein, wrote in the Psychiatric News that the diagnosis gave them, quote, a sense of uniqueness and belonging, and that they had christened themselves as Aspies, and that to delete the diagnosis diagnosis might, quote, deprive them of their identity. So the, the, the people, the APA and the writers of the DSM are well aware that they are creating identities that people are clinging to. And clinging to these identities creates, you know, ultimately just as many problems as they're attempting to solve. So when a diagnosis becomes an identity, it acts as a, as a binding force to the illness rather than wellness. So, so now you're clinging to illness rather than wellness, and it makes it all the more likely that you will self-envision yourself as someone who needs to stay on pharmaceutical drugs and treatments rather than not. And in the case of gender dysphoria, identifying with the diagnosis, of course, puts kids on a lifelong path of medicalization. And not only that, but the social pressure to stay with the diagnosis is fierce. And the consequences for rejecting the diagnosis are extreme. And unlike any other diagnoses like suicidal ideation disorder or anorexia nervosa, where recovery is celebrated by the surrounding community, when desisters and detransitioners realize they don't have gender dysphoria, that they are hounded, harassed, threatened, vilified, and attempts are made to silence their voices in the media. I mean, that is, that's, that's insane right there. We should be celebrating their health. Even the, the mental health field should be celebrating. Well, they've, they've found health. They found equilibrium and wellness. Um, I want to point out here that there is th this diagnosis, gender dysphoria, is being used by groomers within this GC movement. Um, I don't know if you all know the AGP man, Sarah Higdon. He's written for the Post Millennial. He used to uh, own the site Trans Against Groomers. He's been a spokesperson for Gays Against Groomers, uh, and he claims to be a GC ally. Uh, I heard him speak on a panel called Stolen Innocence, the insidious ideology infecting your children's education, hosted by Parents on Control and No Left Turn Education in Wisconsin. He told parents, while sadly shaking his head, I'm here to tell you that gender dysphoria is not curable. You have it for life. Hmm. He has a vested interest in saying this. He's also spoken publicly about how he uses women's bathrooms and women's locker rooms, despite knowing that women do not want him in our spaces. How convenient for him to promote the notion of the diagnosis of gender dysphoria as something that is lifelong and innate. He is using this as a manipulation tool to break boundaries. He is a groomer. Um, and the handy formula, just so you know, for grooming is charm, like saying the right thing in a GC space, charm plus normalization and desensitization of increasing boundary violations over time. So this man and others like him, including sometimes, not always, sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong, but orgs like Gays Against Groomers that use GC talking points as charm in order to normalize and desensitize men in women's spaces. And gender dysphoria, that diagnosis is one of the big manipulation tools being used to normalize men in women's faces. <laughs> this, this is, we, we should not accept this. This is unacceptable. Um, so that diagnosis is an empathy trap. Um, and in their book um, called The Empathy Trap, uh, Tim and Janet McGregor talk about the relationship between the empath, the sociopath, and the apath. Um, 
And of course, the anyone who's apathetic doesn't really care what the sociopath is doing, but the empath is the natural enemy of the sociopath because the empath <laughs> can't stand to the sight of someone else in pain. Thus, the diligent, the truly diligent sociopath has to create an empathy trap to derail the empath's response. So our, our empathetic pain responses are natural to us. They are primary. As I, as I always talk about in embodiment, our bodies are our primary safeguarding tool. You touch a hot pan, your body recoils. You, you have an, a fear instinct. That is your body telling you something. Our bodies um, alert us to danger. So uh, when we see a child in pain, when, when I mention, if I mention to you, hey, there are kids out there and their bodies getting, getting cut, your natural empathetic response to a child in pain is going to come in. You're going you're gonna to have an empathetic reflex. No, we, we shouldn't cut children. Um, we, we wince in, in our empathetic pain response. That is our natural response system at work. Um, but when adults are inundated with material that tells them that there's there are some poor kids that that really have gender dysphoria and they they really suffer this incongruence between their gender identity and their sex assigned at birth and that they're born in the wrong body and that their oh their extreme distress can lead to suicide well child suicide is a very good empathy trap and it's an effective tool to invert our natural empathetic response when it comes to child genital mutilation so um the the creation of the trans child who is suffering gender dysphoria is quite the empathy trap and it's first of all unlikely that insurance providers were going to cough up money for extreme plastic surgeries and body altering drugs under the DSM-3's diagnosis of transsexualism as a sexual paraphilia and nor would Amy they sorry oh, I'm going to have to yeah, sorry. I think if you I'm sorry, talk, I'm wrap sorry. Up, no, you don't, because it's so, so interesting. And uh, people have been saying, hopefully you could write this up as an article. I'm, or, I'm or going to write it up. If you just maybe say one more thing and then because we, we have to move on. Well, you know, I'm going to end with just I'm going to say two more minutes. So just want to end with the 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 think of the idea of the Little Mermaid. So the Hans Christian Andersen story, she, she wants to be in a body that she does not possess. She cuts off her own tail. And what does she do to gain this? She sells her voice. And, and in the end, she's given a, a choice to either kill the prince or, or to kill herself. Um, and we can think of this psychologically, um, that, that she's given this choice to, to kill the impossible dream. But in, in this tale, she chooses to dissolve into the sea. She goes into, into unconsciousness. She does not gain consciousness about her own actions and situations. Um, so when when our children are going through this gender dysphoria, when they when they see themselves this way, they are losing their voice. They are cut off from their bodies. Uh, and today's kids are having their bodies cut off for an unattainable dream. And in the process, they're losing their voice, being uncomfortable with sexist, regressive stereotypes. Um, it's not a mental illness and, and it's depoliticizing to call it one. It creates self at attack um, and it suppresses possible political action. Once I got interested in this, I've just been researching more and more about the DSM in general and how they create their diagnoses and how this relates to medications. Uh, most of it does not pertain to gender dysphoria, but I hope that um, we all will continue this research and keep opening it up because I think uh, the topic of uh, gender dysphoria is kind of this last hook that's that's hooking us, and it it still taps into our feelings like, oh, this these poor children they are they're having this um, very real distress. And I think where where I hope to go with this is bring this into uh, Stephen Hassan's uh, bite model for um, cult think and cult in engagement, and the way that he talks about cults is that it doesn't have to come from a central 
leader. It can be something that is disseminated through the culture. So I look at this a lot more as social engineering, social contagion, rather than a disorder or mental illness uh, that a child is facing.